But the Lord says, rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and the Lord will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord re require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, listen for this familiar passage. And I will read it rather slowly because the dramatic effect of the words will penetrate your hearts, I believe, as they do mine every time I read it. Listen for the word of God as Jesus has gone up the mountain, his disciples have joined him, and he begins to preach and speak and share with others. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely for my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this powerful passage, I thought about even renaming this sermon and something I may not have shared for a long time, but when I entitle a sermon, I go back and forth with what I should name it, with how the title reflects on what's being preached in the message and the whole theme of the morning's worship. And if I could rename this sermon, I think I will. If I could rename this sermon, I would entitle it, A Hold on the Heart. The hold that Jesus has on our hearts and souls keeps us aware of all, the has, all he has taught, all that we cherish, and all that we are called to do in his name. 
The themes are outlined beautifully in the Sermon on the Mount and particularly in the Beatitudes. Like many of you, perhaps, my family read from the Bible when we children were in bed at night getting ready to go to sleep. There was always a story that my mom told or my big sister told or scriptures that they read from the Bible because they felt sincerely that those last words a child hears before we went to sleep were the important words of scripture, the important words that would penetrate our hearts and souls as we slept through the night. And so frequently they read from scriptures or they told us stories, Bible stories and others, usually a story with a real message. And I followed suit with my own children. And the lessons from the Sermon on the Mount were and are unforgettable. Unforgettable because like some of you perhaps, I imagined that Jesus was sitting and talking with me, that he was sitting and talking with my family. And we kids imagined that we could reach out and shake his hand or touch his clothes or invite him home to dinner like so many pastors and bishops who fellowshiped with our families on Sundays and other times used to do. Or sometimes we talk about how we would be the one to run and get him water if he were with us. And we'd go back and forth. I would be the one to get to the water first. My nephew Lynn would go, no, I would be the one because I run faster than you. And someone, one of our friends would go, no, I can run faster than both of you. I would be the one. We would sit around and talk about all the things we could do if Jesus was right there with us. Well, being children, what we sort of realized and sort of didn't was that Jesus was already there. We just couldn't see him. We couldn't talk to him the way we were used to talking with people that we could see and touch and who shook hands with us and who told us to sit still on Sunday mornings and that was not possible for little kids. But you know, they knew it and it was okay. It was okay because we brought life to the congregation and we reminded others that we were part of that life, the life of Jesus Christ, the life of the world, the life for all. So in one way, in that way, in many ways, Jesus had a hold on our hearts. He had a hold on our souls. And although we weren't sure what the future would bring in terms of careers or life or even cities where we would live, we imagined that we could reach out and touch him. So for us, Jesus was real. For today, for us, Jesus remains real. He was and is really God and was really human. And he cared for the inner peace for every one of us. He also cared for the socio-political and economic situations and issues of the time. And so in this passage today, what is primary is not only that personal relationship with God, what's really equally important is the social responsibility that we have for our communities, the nation, and the world. And that's what sits and takes a hold of my heart in the Beatitudes this morning. For many reasons, the Sermon on the Mount, which included the teachings of the Beatitudes, had a powerful meaning for the people then and now, because these teachings are real. They are significant for many, many reasons, and they have a hold on our hearts and souls. And for some reason, whenever my mother or my sister particularly would get to this particular part of the Beatitudes. She would read it with more expression than I knew in most times. And she read the whole passage with great dramatic flair. But this particular one was close to her heart for many reasons. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then with equal drama, she would read, blessed are the peacemakers, 
And she would say that word so slowly, so carefully, peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. My friends, the Beatitudes have so much, so much meaning, so much message, so much to tell us today. For the meaning is far more than just our personal relationship with God. It is our relationship with the community, with the nation, with the world, with the entire globe, because we are called to be God's people in every way. Personally, socially, politically, economically, we are called to love humanity with all that we are, with all that God has given to us, and with all that Jesus Christ brought to the world. Recapping these last few stories leading up to today, perhaps this context in which Jesus went up the mountain and his disciples joined him will just touch our hearts a little more. And we recapped it a little bit last week, but I'll do it again just briefly. You see, in the past few stories, Jesus had been baptized. He had been driven out into the wilderness. He had mastered that wilderness experience and had even seen through the manipulations of Satan. And the angels had come and they had ministered to him, further preparing him for the ministry that was ahead. And so he was totally prepared for his ministry. God had called him to something unique and powerful and difficult and challenging. And God does not send us out without preparation. He called his disciples from their various places of life and living. He healed many of the various physical and spiritual ills that people had, and people kept coming to him. He continued to be a role model for the disciples, and now his ministry continued in an unforgettable, dramatic form. So Jesus saw the crowds, all these people coming to him with various needs. The scriptures say he went up to the mountain, and his disciples came with him. And like the fine rabbi that he was, he sat down. That's what rabbis did in those times. They sat down to speak and preach and read. He sat down and he began to speak. And the teachings he imparted that day were classic teachings of Jesus. And so these Beatitudes are what the particular teachings are called, and they are classic teachings of Jesus the Christ. One theologian summarizes this part of his ministry extremely well. This theologian says, while Jesus is being tempted in the desert, John the Baptist is being arrested by Herod. The incarceration of John becomes a turning point in Jesus' ministry. Jesus withdraws to Galilee, and he begins, like John, to preach a message of repentance. So leading up to the Sermon on the Mount, the verses preceding Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount the evangelist emphasizes two key points, and those I want to leave with you today. The Beatitudes are so vast and significant and deep in meaning that it is hard to deal with this whole passage in one sermon. So I share these things with you because you'll continue and we'll continue as a congregation in the study of these unforgettable words of Jesus. And as we do, we'll remember the words that others have written, the words that Jesus shared, and the thoughts and feelings we have ourselves and how we interpret them. So the first key point is that the Messiah's ministry will fulfill scripture by bringing light to those in darkness. For those who lived in darkness, a great light has come. That light, as we see it, is Jesus Christ. That light, as prophesied, was the Messiah who was to come. Matthew sees Jesus' ministry as a fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah, using the quotations from Isaiah, one of which says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has 
come near. And we remember that's what John spoke, speaking the words of Isaiah that had been shared years before. Next, Jesus says to his disciples, follow me and I will make you fish for people. In other words, I will make you search for, I will make you reach for, I will make you capture the souls and hearts of those with whom you are engaged in ministry. Fish for people, share the word, touch the hearts, be engaged with those in our communities, see the needs of people and reach out to empower, to enrich, to care for. The disciples were so engaged they left their nets, committed to follow Jesus Christ, and kept moving forward with him. Second, the Messiah's healing ministry is connected very strongly with his teaching and preaching ministry. Now, for Matthew, it's Jesus' teaching ministry that is so important and is primary and has such an emphasis in this gospel. Jesus' ministry attack, attracts crowds that cluster around the mountain. And Jesus, like Moses before him, goes up the mountain to share the revelation from God. So interesting that Jesus Christ and his work and his ministry has some connection in the past with Moses and how Moses operated, how Moses ministered. Interesting that we see some of those similarities. But what's beautiful is that we see them in a new context. We see them with people who might not even have known much about Moses, who didn't know much about who Jesus was, what they knew was that here was a rabbi and a teacher and a preacher and a healer who shared God's love with them. No matter who they were, no matter where they came from, no matter what their situation. For Matthew, Jesus teached and taught and preached and healed. And he did so with a love for all humankind. And so the Sermon on the Mount is the first and actually the longest of Jesus' teachings in the Gospel of Matthew. And I'll share this part still from our theologian from the uh, Bible study entitled simply Interpretation. He says one of the themes in the Gospel of Matthew is that of genuine righteousness, a righteousness or right relationship with God, and that purifies the inward life and energizes the faithful to seek justice for the vulnerable. Always caring about others who may not be in as privileged a place as some, but who are valued just as much by Almighty God. Obedience is essential in this teaching of right relationship. Because if we are in right relationship or righteousness with God, we are obedient. We are called to care for the whole person, that person's physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental well-being. Jesus cares for all of us, and he cares for the whole person. And that is what we are called to do, to care for the whole person. As many of you know now, I have traveled to the Democratic Republic of the Congo on two separate occasions with an enriching, encompassing, all-empowering message for being in a country that cares for people, loves visitors, and will give all they have out of hospitality. There's a Congolese greeting that people are prone to share with one another. And on the, surface, on the surface, it says, greetings, blessings, I wish you well, I wish you good health. It's a one word greeting and it means far more than what people often hear. What it really means is, I wish your 
well-being to be well. I wish you well-being from the soul, from the heart, from deep within your essence. I wish you well. So yes, it means I wish you good health. I wish you to have a good day. I wish you all of the blessings of life. But most importantly, it means I wish you well from the soul. I wish you well in every aspect of life. I wish you well in heart, in spirit, and in mind. Wellness from the soul. When one thinks of the Sermon on the Mount, I hope that phrase comes to mind. I wish your being to be well. I wish the being of everyone to be well, the meek, those who mourn, the pure in heart, all. Blessed are they. Blessed are they. Literally, the, transmission, the translation blessed means, oh, the blessedness of. And when I think about, oh, the blessedness of, I think it gives a deeper context. We say, oh, the blessedness of those who are poor in spirit. Oh, the blessedness of those who mourn. Oh, the blessedness of the meek. Oh, the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Oh, may they who care for the world be blessed. Not only those who may mourn for loss of loved ones or loss of income or loss of a home, but we pray for those around the world. We pray for the loss of unity between organizations and communities and families and people and those who are new in certain areas. Oh, the blessedness of those who care for everyone. My friends, today, we are called to care for everyone, to take these beatitudes, to take them to heart, to read this passage with drama, with flair, but with a new commitment to God in Jesus Christ, to know that we are loved and that obedience, service with empowerment, and well-being of the souls of others and ourselves there's a strong social justice message in the Beatitudes today. And so I end with just a couple of questions for you. I end with asking, how well is your soul today? How well is your spirit in heart today? Are you well in spirit, in emotion, in soul? Is your being well today. With so much that goes on around us, we have to stay in mind, in heart, and aware of what it means to be well in soul. God is present, and God is with us. God never leaves us. God encourages us through Jesus Christ to know that in this passage there is hope, there is joy, there is love, there is a message of how to care for others. The, the Beatitudes have a significance far beyond what is written. Its significance has meaning from deep within and radiates outward to others. What significance do they have for you today? Amen. My friends,